Bryant is, he supervises the DMR biotoxin and water quality programs for Western Maine. He's been in this position for the past year and he's been with the department for over five years. His uh, topic is emerging harmful algal blooms in the Gulf of Maine. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be discussing in particular two harmful algal blooms that are an emerging threat to the uh, shellfish industry in Maine. <coughs> By way of background, DMR has been doing harmful algal bloom monitoring for over 20 years. We are, uh, pay particular attention to specific species of phytoplankton which are known to cause biotoxins which can accumulate in shellfish, cause people to get sick when they consume those shellfish. And we do this routinely throughout the year at stations located along the whole coastline. We have volunteers that help us to collect those phytoplankton. The three kinds of shellfish poisoning that people can get from eating shellfish contaminated by biotoxins would be paralytic shellfish poisoning or PSP. This is what people are most commonly familiar with. This is what's usually called red tide at very high concentrations can lead to red coloration in the water, but you don't have to have uh, a visible bloom in order to get sick from these shellfish. This is very common. This Poisoning uh, occurs yearly. We have regular blooms of Alexandrian, which cause this toxicity. And shellfish, every year, at some locations, exceed the regulatory limit. We're very familiar with this. The industry is very familiar with this. The next shellfish poisoning that we monitor for would be diuretic shellfish poisoning. This is caused by species of Dinophysis and Prorocentrum lima, a couple of groups of shell of phytoplankton. We've never in Maine had shellfish which have gone above the regulatory limit for DSP, but it's something that we still monitor for. And finally, the one that's of concern today would be amnesic shellfish poisoning. This is caused by some species of the phytoplankton, Pseudonychia. This blooms annually across Maine's uh, coastline. The blooms are traditionally have been non-toxic or occasionally have extremely low levels of toxin. And until 2016, we had never had any shellfish go above the regulatory limit. It was always just something in our contingency plan, which we monitored for just in case. Amnesic shellfish poisoning is caused by a <coughs> neurotoxin produced by the phytoplankton species, some species of phytoplankton, uh, excuse me, pseudonychia. It's a neurotoxin, there's no known cure. If you're afflicted with ASP, you just treat the symptoms. Symptoms uh, are usually what's commonly associated with food poisoning. You get uh, vomiting, nausea, diarrhea, you know, upset stomach, you just treat that. When you have high doses of domoic acid, you can end up with permanent loss of short-term memory. You can have uh, motor weakness, coma, or even death, since it's a neurotoxin, it's affecting the nervous system. So 2016, and then again in 2017, what changed? You can see in the blue circles, uh, in Down East Maine, we had a number of our permanent biotoxin stations where we found shellfish that exceeded the regulatory limit in occasions five, six times the regulatory limit at levels where you would be getting sick from these shellfish. Then again in 2017, we experienced the exact same thing except as you can see with the, the red triangles, the extent along the coastline where we had shellfish that exceeded the regulatory limit had expanded down in the Casco Bay. What you don't see on this slide is where we had shellfish which had intermediate levels of uh, domoic acid, so right up to 19.9 parts per million, right under the 20 parts per million regulatory limit. If you were to include that, that would cover most of the rest of the coastline, with the, some notable exceptions of parts of Penobscot Bay along the New Hampshire border and upper portions of uh, tidal rivers. In addition to 2016 and 2017 having shellfish exceeding regulatory limits, what we also found was that the speed at which 
Demoic acid was accumulating in shellfish had changed. In previous years, when we saw a pseudonychia bloom in progress, we would use a rapid test kit, which uh, are in the upper right hand corner. They look and function a lot like a pregnancy test, it's an absence presence test, where you just put phytoplankton right onto that kit, and it would just tell you if the demonic acid was present. It's very sensitive, it would tell you at very low levels that you wouldn't be able to see if you did a, a laboratory test. And what would happen would be that we would have, once a bloom's in progress, if for two weeks we would get positive results on these kits, then we would begin collecting shellfish samples and testing them for demoic acid. The, the four graphs here are four different sampling sites from 2016, where on the bottom two graphs you can see the green circles, which are positive Scotia results. Uh, the, the red lines are phytoplankton counts, so that's the bloom happening. And you can see where we were getting hits, showing there was some level of demoic acid happening. And then the blue bars would be <coughs> actual levels of demoic acid in the shellfish tissue. So you're collecting phytoplankton and shellfish separately. And what ended up happening in 2016 was, following that protocol where we were used to these blooms being non-toxic or producing very low levels which accumulate very slowly in shellfish, what ended up happening was, by the time we were collecting our first shellfish sample, we were already close to or had exceeded the regulatory limit. What was happening was that they were just accumulate that there was a lot of toxin and they were uptaking that extremely rapidly. We ended up at uh, once we noticed this pattern, we began sampling immediately shellfish as soon as we were seeing blooms in progress. And as you can see in the top two graphs, sometimes the appearance of a bloom and the uptake of toxin in shellfish almost overlapped. It was a matter of days from our, the first appearance of the bloom until you had toxin within the shellfish sometimes already approaching the regulatory level. So what does that mean? We had two years of shellfish exceeding the regulatory limit when the entire history of the program that had never happened and when toxin was present it was being taken into shellfish much more rapidly than ever had in the past. So we had phytoplankton samples sent out of lab to a lab that could do genetic identification of pseudonychia. We can't with a light microscope tell which species we're looking at. They, they look very similar in shape. When we sent them away, what we found out was <coughs> there was a new species of, of pseudonychia in the Gulf of Maine that had never been documented to be here before outside uh, laboratories and, and scientists routinely monitor pseudonychia in Maine for research pur purposes, including looking at what the species are. So that kind of work had been underway. So this was the year that this first appeared. So once we were able to show what was happening, we had the new species of pseudonychia, which was highly toxic and producing that toxin very quickly, which was being absorbed or uh, uh, taken up by the, uh, the shellfish extremely quickly. We sent a number of samples, phytoplankton samples, to this lab and had them checked for absence presence of this new species of pseudonychia. And what you see on the, the map on the right with the diamonds, the red diamonds were samples we sent away where we were seeing the presence of pseudonychia australis. The black where it was not being uh, shown. This is from 2016. And then the, the image on the left if you look at the, the blue circles again, that's the 2016 shellfish that exceeded regulatory limit. It matched up almost per, uh, perfectly where we had shellfish above the regulatory limit to where we had the presence of this new species of pseudonychia. So we knew this was the culprit. Not only was it here, that was the variable that, that was making the difference. So from that, we knew we needed to adjust our monitoring and sampling strategy to account for something that rather than in the span of weeks from its first appearance was producing toxin to something that in a matter of days is producing toxin and could exceed the regulatory limit by five or six times. That's enough where people do get sick uh, from demoic acid. So what we ended up doing, since we can't in our lab on a light microscope tell the species, what we could tell was some are large and some are small sized. You can see on the image taken out of our lab on the right, these form long chains. 
there's a chain on the right which shows the, the large cell size and the chain on the left which shows the small cell size. We can differentiate that much and we just take all large cell and presume that they're the Pseudonychia australis. So we'll respond much more conservatively when we see a bloom that's large size. What we were also did was we started looking at the percent composition of small to large because what we were noticing was that early in the summer you would have predominantly small cell pseudonychia which would progress over the season to large cell pseudonychia but in addition when that shift happened varied by what part of the coastline you were in with the intention that we don't want to necessarily close as quickly areas where there is a lower risk because of the small cell not producing the toxin. In lining up with what we had seen in the shellfish toxin, uh, we, when we began looking at the species composition, these pie graphs that are blue and red, the large are the percent of the large cell and the blue is the percent of the small cell. So this is September and October of this past year, and what we noticed was that species switched to large cell down East Maine first, and then it moved down the coastline. And that lined up exactly with what we were finding in the toxicity. Became, shellfish became toxic down East Maine before they became toxic in Casco Bay. So this further confirmed that Pseudonychia australis that was, that was our problem. In addition, we were able to purchase piece of equipment that lets us do ASP testing in-house in 2017. We previously had to send samples to a third-party lab and by having our own system in place we were able to increase our capacity for how many samples we would do we could do per day. This makes a big difference when you need those results in order to reopen an area or to keep an area open so having that double capacity is extremely important. This also provided redundancy. If one system went down, we still have the other system to use and not cause a delay in being able to uh, reopen or keep open a shellfish harvesting area. We also, as a repercussion from this, had to adjust when we begin sampling shellfish. We now sample shellfish at much lower levels of pseudonychia in the water, so smaller blooms will now trigger us to go out there and collect shellfish. It's expensive, it takes a lot of time to get out there and get these shellfish, but it's now it's a necessary step that we have to take. We also don't wait uh, for two positive Scotia results before we're getting out there. You get a positive, the, that rapid test kit, that uh, pregnancy test. You get a positive result on that, we know if there's toxin being produced, we're immediately out sampling. So it's an increased burden, but it's, it's what's necessary to monitor for this new strain. All right, so that's Pseudonychia australis and the increased uh, threat level that we now have for amnesia shellfish poisoning. This caused uh, a number of closures, both fall 2016 and especially in fall 2017, where it, it spread to the entire coastline and caused months of closures uh, between all the harvesting areas. The next harmful algal bloom that we've had to deal with in 2017 is called Perennia mikimotoi. This is also a species of phytoplankton never previously docu got documented in the Gulf of Maine. In 2017, we began seeing this unknown phytoplankton species in samples. Uh, in August, we didn't know what it was. We had to investigate what it was. This is. It's an unarmored dinoflagellate, so it looks a lot like Alexandrium that causes PSP. The, the, the shape is very similar. It's a warm water phytoplankton, so it's something that you're not going to be seeing in the wintertime, and because it's a warmer water species, it wasn't thought to be able to thrive in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, it's not a public health risk. You're not going to get sick from eating shellfish that have perennium and kimotoi in them. However, it does secrete a mucus that can clog gills that clogs gills of shellfish and uh, other marine fauna and can cause uh, a stress to those animals or potentially kill them. In addition, if you have a, a large bloom, then they'll actually create anoxic zones in the water which can kill off marine life. So August, 
we start seeing this in the water in southern Maine around Casco Bay at low levels. New Hampshire also reports low levels of this unknown phytoplankton. We have some ideas of what it could be. No one thinks it's this because it's not supposed to be in Maine. September comes and the Four River has a phytoplankton bloom. This is water taken just from the surface. This is what the water looked like in the Four River. Uh, we had in excess of 30 million cells per liter. That, that's just in such saturation that the water is completely discolored like this. There's a strong odor, strong scum being produced. And within a matter of days of getting the, our report of the bloom happening in the Four River, we end up increasing our phytoplankton sampling throughout Casco Bay to look for this. We start identifying at higher levels throughout the bay. We're taking dissolved oxygen samples to see if it's having an effect uh, on the water. And what we found have happened is the bloom in, Cap in the Four River leaves and goes into Casco Bay, it disperses. The levels in the Four River drop, so you don't see the coloring as much. You can still smell it a little bit, but it's been dispersed throughout all of Casco Bay. You start, we start to see it along shorelines, especially in low energy areas, so up high into coves, where there's not a lot of uh, wave action or high energy winds blowing on it, and it's just it's hanging out along the edges of mud flats, you can visibly see it, it looks like st brown streaking in the water. And then, for the next month, we're getting reports of dark brown water, odor, surface scum, scum on mud flats. We are getting reports from uh, lobstermen that in isolated areas, when they pull up their traps, everything in those traps are dead. So it's killed the lobsters, it's killed eels, whatever's in those traps. They just were unable to move out of that anoxic zone that was being created locally by these blooms. We also were getting low dissolved oxygen readings when we were going out collecting samples, <coughs> showing this was stressing out, this was causing a stressor on the environment, which some animals like a lobster are going to move away, but the shellfish can't move away. You get animals trapped in uh, cotton traps, they can't move away. And we also started repeat, receiving reports of shellfish dying. Uh, we had a number of locations where low in the inner tidal clams would just all be dead. We also, in the Four River, were taking mussel samples, and there would be high mortalities along the uh, docks when we were collecting those samples. So, about six weeks, the bloom lasts and then it goes away. We're now at a position where the number of unresolved questions about how Korean uh, Miki Motoi got here in the first place. It's never previously documented in the Gulf of Maine. Was it from storms? There were a lot of uh, major storms that went up the East Coast in 2017. Could have been from currents just pulling it in due to water change, uh, water temperature changes in the Gulf of Maine. It's just more uh, appropriate now for this species? Was it from ballast water that have brought it? You're, you're dealing with Portland Harbor and, you know, is it from a ship that, there's, we don't know. Also, is it here to stay? Is it going to be repeated this next year? It's a dinoflagellate, so it's like Alexandrium. They make cysts so they can fall out of the water and come back the next year. So there is the potential that this is still in our water, just in the sediment. When the environmental conditions are right, it will come back. And finally, will its range extend? Like with Sudanichi, we saw it extend our, the range of it extend from one year to the next. It was only in Casco Bay this year. Will it extend past that? We don't know. New Hampshire was observing low levels of this in 2017. Massachusetts think they also saw it around the same time in 2017. So this is something that could become a regional threat. That's it. Any questions? Yes. Does the ASP, does that affect all shellfish? It can potentially become toxic in all shellfish. One thing that's a challenge for ASP compared to what we're uh, historically used to with PSP <coughs> is PSP you knew 
a progression that certain species of shellfish would take in the toxin more quickly than others. Mussels, we use them as our sentinel species. They would always just decide to take up the toxin first. You could do a mussel closure and then do rolling closures as you need to for soft shell clams. ASP works completely different. What we found were mussels and soft shell clams were usually taking up the toxin at the exact same rate. Sometimes the soft shell clams were taking it up faster. So we, could, we, we couldn't use that same kind of uh, progression strategy of close one species, then start sampling the next species. It didn't affect all species at the same rate. We did test all species. Some of them uh, didn't show the toxin or showed it at real low levels, depending on the location. But no one bloom lasted for more than a few weeks in any one location, so it's harder to get a long-term trend. Some species can just stop pumping, American oysters being one of them. So, there could be a time lag before they would show the toxin, like they do with PSP. That, the uh, that ASP, uh, down east you noticed it, uh, and then it went uh, towards Casco Bay. Mm -hmm. um, do we know the water temperature? Uh, does that, I mean, I know it's cold. Yep. Uh, does that have a concern that we're down towards colder water? Uh, and what is the temperature that would kill this or would subdue this bloom? Mm -hmm. There's a number of different species of Pseudonychia. There's different temperatures at optimal temperatures for each of the species. Pseudonychia australis. So first what that means is we see blooms throughout the summer, but you see some are small, some are large. Pseudonychia australis prefers colder temperatures, so we saw it more into the fall. It actually lasted in, in Casco Bay until the middle of January. We've never had right. a phytoplankton bloom in January. Well, that's, that's, I mean, do we know, does cold water slow it down, or does it thrive in cold water? I mean, it seems, if, you know, right. we have these algae in the summertime here, but they were yep. pretty much a joke. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> we, we don't know that. I mean, Take a couple other questions, and then we have to move on. So if the Cyrenitria Australia's first saw it, down east, what's happening in Brunswick and how much do you guys talk in New Brunswick from their shellfish monitoring program? They do provide us ASP results when they take shellfish. They don't sample phytoplankton, so we don't have the full picture. Yeah. So it's it's hard to know if they actually have the strain and they, they haven't been sending that I'm aware. They haven't been sending any samples off to have genetic identification done to see if Australis is present or not. They did also have closures, though, in 2017, anyway. Did you check lobsters for demoid acid? Did you test them to see what? Yeah, that ha that, those studies have been done in the past. We did have a uh, comprehensive CDC report that showed that the level of demoic acid that needs to be present in lobsters to, to be a public health risk. It would take an ex exceedingly high level, and even with that exceedingly high level of demoic acid, people would have to be eating an unrealistic number of pork meal portions. So unlike PSP, where it, it can still be a public health risk, there's not a, 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 a likely public health risk. I just really. want to clarify that, though, that this is lobster tamale that we're talking about. The meat is not impacted by biotoxins. 